Hello everyone. I was on the Osprey publishing website the other day looking for some military history books and I spotted that they've just released this board game based on uh, the novel by Susanna Clarke, Jonathan Strange and Mr. Noel. And as I mentioned that book quite recently in a video, I thought I would uh, get hold of it and um, investigate what it was like. Now, um, I don't play a great many board games. Uh, I enjoy them, but um, um, my circumstances are that I don't have a circle of uh, family or friends who are really into board games. So um, I, I sort of welcome games that are that are solo, but this one isn't unfortunately, it's for two to four players. Um, so it's unlikely that I'll ever I'll ever get to to, to play it but or play much of it. But uh, at the same time my enthusiasm for Susanna Clark's book is so intense that I'm quite happy to feed my appetite on anything else that, that comes along. So I thought I would uh, make a, a video and show you, give, give you a sort of brief review of it and so on. So let's open it up and see what's in it. Okay, first up then, this is the board itself, uh, which represents uh, two maps effectively. Over on the right hand side here, you have a map of Western Europe. So principally, England, France, Italy and Spain. And then on the left here you have a, a sort of zoomed in map of London which is this area here. And within the map of London there are various locations. Now um, it's a very, I, I was a little bit taken aback by the size of this map, because this board, because it's actually very, very small. Um, if, if I put a, a one foot ruler down there, you can see it's only about, it's less than two feet wide. It's probably about one foot nine inches wide and less than a foot and a half high or tall. Um, that's fine in one respect in that um, most of the game actually takes place around the board so you need a lot of playing area around the board to place cards and mats and so on rather than the actual board itself um, but each player will play one of four characters um, and they have a they have a sort of placemat for each character so you have a, you have one for Gilbert Norell uh, one for Jonathan Strange, one for a character called Miss Redruth, who I don't actually remember from the book. Um, and I might, I might just have forgotten the name and she might be one of the principal characters. And one for uh, John Segundus, who is another um, aspirant magician in the story. Um, so you have up to four players, but uh, you really do. Have, it, it is competitive rather than cooperative, um, and you can't play solo. So you really need a minimum of two players. Each player has uh, various tokens and so on. So if I go back to Gilbert Norell, his card is in a sort of beige kind of colour. So this is his playing piece here. And um, at the beginning of the game, uh, you place that anywhere you like on the on the table, on the board. Um, the idea of the game is that um, it takes place between between the period eighteen oh six to eighteen seventeen. So there are twelve turns in the game, each one representing a year. So you begin in the year 1806 with a token there marking the the uh, calendar which you move along turn by turn um, and 
the object of the game is to um, defeat the gentleman with the thistle down hair. Now th this is where, um, so he's, he's represented with a black token which he placed here to begin with. And basically his uh, magic magical strength is going to increase as the game goes on. Um, so you're going to move this token along this scroll here. But as I was about to say, this is where I find um, there's a little bit of a dilemma with this game. Because um, you really have to be into the book and have read the book at the very least. Um, and to to appreciate some of the references in this game um, so you have to kind of understand the the role that the, the gentleman with the thistle down hair who is a fairy um, plays in in the plot and there are lots of other references obviously to the book as well um, if you're coming to this without any knowledge of of Suzanne Clark's novel then um, you you have to sort of um, quickly get into the into the atmosphere of the game, and I, that that is something that is almost impossible um, because of the because of the intricacy of the book and because of its um, depth of scholarship and the the wit and the style of the writing and the the the, the um, portrayal of the characters and the world in which it's set, um, which is part historical and part fantasy, um, it's it's very hard to kind of portray all that in a board game. So a lot of these a lot of these references and so on to various characters are going to be a little bit obscure um, to board game players who simply want this as a game to play. Um, I'm not saying that the mechanisms of the game are um, uh, inferior in any way. It is actually from what from what I can make out and what I've tried, you know, I've tried out some of the mechanisms myself just to see how it plays, and it it is it is quite a good game that will produce quite a um, an interesting strategy kind of game. But at the same time. Um, it's very odd to sort of dovetail that in with the, with 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 the the the, the novel itself, the story of the novel, and you might you might have people like myself who are coming to it more more as an enthusiast of the novel, um, uh, confronting people who are coming to it simply as enthusiasts of board games. And there is a little bit of a um, dichotomy there. But anyway, so the object of the game is to beat um, the gentleman with the um, thistle down hair, to outdo him in magicianship. Now, there are lots and lots of cards that come with this game. Um, let's, let's take you back to the mat first of all, though. Let's zoom in on that a little bit. So this is Gilbert Norell's playing surface, playing mat. And represented here is the silver basin. Now again, unless you've read the book or seen the TV series, you're not really going to be familiar with the silver basin, but it's basically a silver basin filled with water in which um, magicians can um, see images and so on. Um, so on the on the um, basin in the middle of the basin you place six tokens and each turn um, you have the opportunity to use one of these six abilities so for instance um, this is a special ability, so each character will have their own special ability. 
This is to acquire a book of magic. This is to make use of the King's Roads. Again, unless you are aware of the book, the story, you're not necessarily going to know what the King's Roads are, but they're a way of stepping in and out of mirrors and using this um, intricate network of uh, roads and bridges and passageways and so on that will take you to another portal in another part of of the map so you can you can rather than moving your piece around square at a time um, you can actually move across the map in one go um, and then you've got three um, pairs of elements here which you're allowed to practice magic in even if that's not the prevailing element of the turn and then down the bottom here um, you have um, separate spaces where you can place additional tokens to demonstrate that you've made a connection and the connection um, will give you certain abilities and so on and enhance your um, strength in the game. So, oops, sorry, zoom out again, take you back to the board. So as I said a moment ago, and then interrupted myself, there are lots of cards in this game. Um, there are the cards of Marseille, which are effectively tarot cards, but they're described as cards of Marseille in the, in the novel. Um, so there's one of the, there are 12 of these, so there is one card for each turn of the game. So at the beginning of the game, when you're setting up, you draw one at random and turn it over, and that is the card that is in use for the first turn of the game. Um, so it's La Maison Dieu, the House of God, and it has a number of symbols on it. This symbol here, the Black Raven, is the number of spaces by which the man with the thistle down hair is going to progress along the scroll in this turn. So at the beginning of the turn, that's the first thing you do is turn up a new uh, Marseille card and then you move the gentleman with the thistle down hair that number of spaces. So for instance, on turn one, we would move him six spaces along there. Um, these, two, these two symbols here represent various elements, which are the elements that um, in which you can dabble in magic during this turn. So there are six altogether. Um, I can get one of each out to show you. One of the nice things I like about these tokens is that they're not card on one side, so you can turn them over and they have the same symbol. So um, the six elements are wind, hills, rocks, trees, rain and birds so if we go back to that card of Marseille in turn in this turn so we, this is turn one effectively um, you can perform magic using either wind or rain but there are another four elements available to you in the game so you keep that um, to one side so that all the players can see it and know what's going on. Um, I'll explain what that other symbol is in a moment. Um, then you have books of magic. Now, um, as, I was, as I was talking about in the, the previous video, 
uh, in my introduction to the fantasy series when I was talking about this book. Um, the books of magic are quite significant um, in the novel because they give you this sort of uh, impression of a vast archive um, of magical knowledge and so on which is out there in this in this world and um, so there are a whole number of cards representing various books of man language so there you've got the language of birds the life of martin pale um, the anatomy of a minotaur uh, the excellences of christo judaic magic there's lots of lots of titles of of magic books and at the beginning of the game you turn three face up and you place them in these spaces here by the side of the board all the other all the other cards with what what other books of magic are available are left face down on one side um, you also have cards for feats of magic so they're quite a large number of these forget the exact number there's about 40 i think um, now each of these feats of magic um, reference um, episodes in the novel so this goes back to the thing that I was saying a moment ago about how unless you're familiar with the story this isn't really going to mean a vast amount to you um, but this so this feat of magic which is reported in this newspaper the London Courier is magician steps into mirror only to appear elsewhere so that's a reference back to uh, the magician making use of the king's roads that i was saying earlier but anyway at the beginning of the game you have four of these uh, feats of magic which again you draw at random placed along this side of the board And the rest, again, are placed face down to the side. Now, um, as I was saying earlier, there are various elements in the game. Um, so in order to... Uh, you, start the, you start the game, each player starts the game as well with three of these cards in their hand. So for instance, Mr. Noel might have these three cards already in his hand. So in order to, to actually perform this particular feat of magic, for instance, uh, the player playing Mr. Norell will have to get hold of two tokens representing the wind element and one token representing the rain element. And when he has then completed this set, he, is, he can then immediately perform this act of magic so he can then turn this card over and keep it face down close to him and this will boost his magical power by three points um, all of these are three points but you can get you can get some that are two some that are four um, they're not all they're not all necessarily three points so in the game also Oh yeah, sorry. Once you have performed a magical feat as well, you can then acquire a spell. So there are lots of cards um, with various spells on them. So you again, you take one off the top of the back. Say, say you've completed one, one magical feat, you turn that card over, you draw a spell. And this particular spell um, says... Place one free rain element or hills element token, um, whether the chosen magic type can be played this turn or not. So you're allowed to spend this card immediately um, and select one of those two, two elements, which you can then put on one of your cards. So for instance, if I still had that card standing, it would be quite useful to get that rain element and place it there. Um, or you can discard the card for one additional prestige point. Prestige points I'll come to in a moment. Um, there are also in the game... Um, 
I pointed out earlier that um, you can make connections during the course of the game, but there are also six named characters, um, one for each type of, of connection. So you can actually acquire if they are available and two of these again drawn from random two of these will be drawn at the start of the game and placed face up beside the board so if you if you want to make a connection of a coachman um, and Davy, the actual named coachman is available you can actually pick this um, and then having connect having named connections helps you um, more than just having a generic coachman during the game. Um, so more on that again in a moment. Um, and then the main cards that you play with, I think there are 48, yeah there are 48 each of those. I said 48 for the other, the feats of magic, there's only 33 for those. So there are 48 invitations, so there's a deck of cards with this um, invitation symbol on them and each one is an invitation to an event at a certain location so this is an invitation to a concert of Italian music which is going to take place in Lisbon so at the beginning of the game again um, you're dealt a certain number of these cards to play with let me tell you exactly how many Right, you get two invitations at the beginning of the game and you also get two introductions and I'll tell you what they are in a moment. And again, the rest of them are pace, placed face down beside the table. Um, so you're not, you're not seeing this as I've, I've sort of zoomed in more or less to the map area. But this is the reason why it's quite useful to have a small board because there's an awful lot of cards lying around the edge of the table as well as those four up to four placemats okay so you also have four introductions so this is the symbol for introduction and they are introductions to certain um, uh, characters and, and notables um, and they're all as far as I can see they're either um, historical figures like Madame de Stael was a a, a notable French uh, societess, soci society hostess um, in Napoleonic France, Francisco Goya, the Spanish artist. Yeah, it's got French woman of letters, they've described her as. Um, there are also characters from the book, like Arabella Strange, who is the wife of Jonathan Strange, um, and so on and so forth. Okay, so you'll get two of these at the beginning of the game as well. Now, the idea of the game is that, uh, where did I put that? Is you have your piece on the board and you're allowed to make two movements um, each turn. So the first thing you do is that you choose an action on your board. So for instance, um, I might choose to acquire a book of magic. Now having done that, um, that token isn't going to be available, that option isn't going to be available to me. I've sort of spent that option until I, I make a particular choice in a, in a later turn. So I acquire a book of magic. I, I can only acquire a book of magic from the three cards that are available beside you there. Um, so let's just pick one at random for the moment and we'll come back to that in a moment. Now, having done that, um, you, have to, you have to replace that. You draw another one off the pack and place it there. 
Had I taken this one or this one, then you would have moved the one that was there down and put the new one there. Um, because there's this steady conveyor belt uh, process with these magic books that at the end of each turn, um, or at the beginning of the next turn, the card that is here gets taken away and discarded and then these all move down. So if you're anxious to get this book here in particular, um, you need to do it this turn, otherwise you're going to lose the opportunity. Um, having chosen your action, then you can start to make your visits and you can move up to two times. So um, if you're in London, you can imagine yourself there. So you have the opportunity, there are no connections here. You can literally just move from one dock to another, but it is still an action. So I could either say I'd do that for one turn and then that for another, or I could say I'll do that for one turn. And then because I'm in London, I can either go to Cambridge, Bath, Brussels or Paris for the second one. Um, so I plan my route largely based on um, what I have here in my in my hand. So I've got a number of invitations and I've got a number of uh, introductions. Uh, now, unfortunately, these are all abroad. So I've started off pretty badly in, in my choice of location in London because two of them are in Lisbon. One of them is in Padua and one of them is in Madrid. Um, but let's say uh, <coughs> let's say I'd started the game in Paris instead. I can do one move, two moves, and then I get to Lisbon. Um, now, every time I get to a spot um, where I have a card, I can play one of the cards. So having got there on my second turn, I can only play one of these. So I'm going to, I'm going to, they're both concerts of Italian music. The only difference between these two cards is that there is a different element up here. So they are different, even though at first glance they appear to be the same card. So um, as the prevailing element for this turn, this is going to be important in a moment, the prevailing elements are wind and rain um, and I've got here I've got wind and hills I'm going to use I want to keep the one that's got the wind on it so I'm going to spend this one that's got the tree or not the trees the hills on it and I can exchange this card for either two introductions two um, feats of magic which I would have to take from here I'm beginning to wonder whether you do get three of those to begin with you know I might have, might have misled you there oh no you do yeah you do um, so I can either exchange this for two introductions two feats of magic or one of each so I, I for instance will take another two introductions so I've drawn another two off the top of the pack here and I've got one oh, that's handy, another one in Lisbon and then one in Threadneedle Needle Street um, to be introduced to Anne Radcliffe um, in London. So I've now got uh, five cards altogether. Um, one of one, one invitation and four introductions. So I discard the one that I just used and then that's my visits done for this turn but i can now perform various um, magic acts um, i should have said as well that you begin the game each player puts a token down there okay so now i can do various um, magic acts um, so the way you do magic is you discard either invitations or introductions um, to exchange them for the tokens. Um, and you're only allowed to exchange tokens 
that are permitted by the card of Marseille. So I'm only allowed to play with wind or rain elements this turn. But as I showed you a moment ago, um, I've got the I've got a, I've got one that's got the wind element on it. The fact that I'm in Lisbon and it's and it's the Lisbon card doesn't matter. You could you could play the um, uh, you could play one from London or anything now. <coughs> so I get rid of that and I pick up a wind token and then I can choose to place it on um, any card I like. So there are th that, that magic feat requires three wind tokens so I'm going to place it on there. And also um, I've got this book of magic here so I could use this this magic book is in my possession for that throughout the game now no one else is no other player is going to gain access to it and this one allows me to convert um, to play any any symbol so I could play any of my other four it doesn't matter but it would it would convert it into a hills element um, now the important thing is that the hills element isn't the prevailing element it isn't a prevailing element in this turn so this is no use to me in this turn um, so I can't play that so that would be the end of my um, the end of the end of my magic phase for this turn um, and then if the year was one of these dark shades here it would give me a chance to confront the gentleman with the thistle down here but that's not available this turn because it's not um, and then I draw coming back to what this uh, other symbol on this side here that I didn't describe earlier I can draw the, that number of invitations invitations mark you not introduction so I can draw two additional invitation cards and that then actually leaves me with six cards in my hand but at the end of the turn I'm only allowed to um, use have, I'm only allowed to hold five cards so I now have to choose one of these to um, dispose of so this phase I'm not sure I think I'm going to dispose of this one because it's not worth much in the, in the way of prestige. So I'm going to dispose of that card. And then that would be the end of my turn. Now, um, that's more or less how the game plays, um, except let's show you, for instance, how to use an introduction. So in the next turn, for instance, um, once every, everyone else plays there, they go obviously, and then it's the beginning of the next turn. So you'd change the card of Marseille, you'd move the, the uh, gentleman with the thistle down here further along, um, you would choose another action. So we had, we had a card, we had a token on there um, already. So I would have to either choose one of these other five actions or I could choose to still the waters, which is basically to remove all the um, tokens that you might have played already and put them back in the middle of the, the middle of the, the dish there. Um, so it renews your opportunity to use actions further on. And then you, you make your actions on the table again. You make your movements on the table. Um, say I had ended up in Lisbon on either my first or second movement. Um, I've got this um, introduction to William Beresford, the first Viscount Beresford in Lisbon. So I can now play this card to gain a certain number of prestige points. And an introduction to William Beresford will give me four um, prestige points. So I can move my token four along there. Now the reason that is important is imagine that there are other players in the game. Um, so you might have 
you might have three um, three other players in the game. The turn the turn sequence, the sequence in which you move, is determined by how far along this prestige chart you are, um, and it's often quite um, critical to get your move in first before someone else in order to acquire Book of Magic, for instance, um, to, to acquire a magical feat from over there. So you are competing with other people in terms of prestige as well. Um, and it's also important if you get, if I, if this player here was to throw, get four prestige points in this game as well and end up there, it's quite important who is actually on top because you play the player on top first of all. Um, there are also, as you go past these uh, black, black symbols here, either land on it or go past it, that then allows you to acquire a connection of your choice. Um, so it allows you to put down um, a token in one of these six uh, squares here. Now the thing is that if there was available um, the two the two connections character connections that I put out at the beginning of the, the game were John Childermas and Davy the coachman. So John Childermas is the man of business. Um, so if one of those two is available and I haven't got either a coachman or a man of business filled, I could actually put a token there or there and then also take the card and then you would draw another card and put that face up, um, making another another character connection possible. So um, the, the rate at which you get, the point at which you get past these uh, black symbols as well, and notice that there are only four of them, so you can't fill all six on your, on your chart anyway, um, is quite important. Uh, right. What else? Yeah, that's more or less every. That's more or less the gameplay. Um, obviously, there's an awful lot of strategy and competition in this. Um, a lot of permutations of what you can do. Um, a lot of kind of unexpected um, circumstances cropping up because you never know what's going to be on the on the cards of Marseille. So, for instance, um, the second turn would have been. Uh, that the gentleman with the thistle, so this is now 1807, he would have moved on three, um, and you've only got the tree element to play with, um, unless you've got a book of magic, or you have uh, opted for an action there that allows you to, to dabble in tree and uh, wind element magic, as well as the prevailing one. Um, so you have to kind of, um, work out what's coming up, work out what your best options are, work out what elements you're in the market for, as it were, trying to acquire. Um, and then um, that then gives you the opportunity, once you've completed the selection, of turning that over. Um, so you've turned it over, you've performed that feat, and that will give you three magical points. Right, so the aim of the game, or the game ends rather, it's not necessarily the aim of the game, but the game ends when um, you have reached a year with, which is coloured darker, so either 1811, 1813, 1815 or 1817. So let's say the year is now 1813. Um, after you've after you've taken your magical phase for your turn, you then confront the fairy, confront the gentleman with the, the thistle down hair, <coughs> and say at this point he is on twenty two magical strength. You then have to um, tot up how much magical strength you have. Now. Um, the way you work it out is that you have a certain number um, 
for the feats that you have completed. So let's say I had completed that one, that one, which is another three. Um, let's take a couple more out of the, if I can find them. There we go. Right, that one, that one. So I've got two, two twos, two threes. So I have um, 10 magical points from having completed those. Those are all face down in front of me. Um, you also add up the number of books of magic that you own and you get one for each book of magic that you own. So that would give me another one. So that would take me up to 11. Um, some of the spells, um, not this one, but some of the spells grant you magical strength. And finally, if you notice, having a pupil, um, so if I had managed to acquire a connection to a pupil, um, then that would have given me an additional three. So that would have put me on 14 magical points. So if I'm confronting the uh, gentleman with the thistle down here, here in the year 1813, I have got what is it? I said 13 or 14, but he is on 22. So I haven't confronted him. So the game will continue and the game continues on like that with each player in the year 1813 confronting him. Um, eventually one of them will hopefully beat him. If not, it gets to 1817 and he might still be unbeaten. Um, sorry, that would be there, 1817. He might still be unbeaten on something like 30 by then. And um, actually he'll be on 36. I'll talk about that in a moment. He'll be on 36. So um, he's unbeaten. You haven't got, you, your, your player might be here by then, 27 or somewhere. Um, so no one actually wins the game. However, if you do manage to beat him, um, say you've got 38 by then, um, you might not necessarily um, win the game because someone else might be further down still to take their turn. So you have beaten the fairy, but this red player might have more than you have in terms of magic and, and more than the fairy. So, um, so you might have, say, 37 points of magic and the red player, even though they're playing second, um, the game is over, but when, he, when they look at their magic, they might have 40 magic points. So it would be the red player that wins the game. So the, 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 the key to winning the game is to build up this number of points. Um, and the principal way you do that is by performing feats of magic. Um, you are having to balance it with uh, boosting your prestige, but it's the magical points that matter in the end. So you can, you can still win the game, even if your prestige is right down here, but you're less likely to because you've got less opportunity of boosting your magic. <clears throat> and that's, that's more or less, I'm sorry, that was a bit convoluted. Um, didn't explain all that very well, but that's how the game plays. Um, in terms of it capturing the atmosphere of the book, um, I think really you have to understand and know the book in order to get the most out of this game. I mean, it's a good game in its own right, but um, having read the book and been familiar with the book, book or being a massive fan of the book like I am, does help you to enjoy the board game a little bit more. Um, I think the board game doesn't help you to enjoy the book anymore. And in fact, there are some notable kind of ways that it diverges from the book. I mean, one of the things um, to me that's very kind of important about the book is that although it's a sort of book about fantasy and English magic, it is set very deliberately and very precisely in this world of 
early 19th century London and Europe. And obviously the, one of the key things that was going on up to the year 1815 were the Napoleonic Wars. Um, and for a lot of the period in which the, 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 the book is set, um, much of this area of Europe is off limits. Um, you certainly wouldn't want to be traveling to France whilst we were at war with them. So Englishmen abroad wasn't really a thing during most of this period. So it's, it's not particularly realistic to show this map of Europe for most of this time. Um, there's a great deal of military um, involvement of one of, the, one of the characters in particular, Jonathan Strange, who accompanies the Duke of Wellington and the Br British Army uh, during the Peninsula War. And equally, he is, um, he is present with the British Army at the Battle of Waterloo, just outside Brussels. So there's certainly, there's certainly an opportunity to go to, for the story to, to cross over into Portugal and Spain and the Low Country um, during the story. Um, doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be over there exchanging kind of um, introductions with Spanish artists and so on. That's not, that's not how the, the plot of the book develops. Um, after the end of the uh, Napoleonic Wars, then the story does move definitely to Venice in particular. Um, and there's a great deal of, of the story unravels in Venice. So it's fair enough to, to move there. But I think that's where it's sort of, um, it's slightly removed. It's, it diverges from the, the story of the novel. And, and really so much of it is set in London. I think, I think they could quite easily have just left the story developing in London with, you know, had the, had the London map far more prominent and maybe just had a few spaces over that side for, for Europe, I don't know. Um, from the point of view of um, aesthetics and so on, I think this would have been their main strength to kind of develop. Maybe even have a sort of three-dimensional, you know, buildings and so on uh, with a nice sort of street plan of London and do it that way. Um, and, you know, the, these things, it, it, you could have even had miniatures. It would have been nice to um, paint up some various miniatures of characters in this game. I would have enjoyed doing that. But overall, I think it does, you know, it, 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 is a, it does sort of feed my appetite for all things Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norell. Um, it's another, you know, it's not, it's nowhere near as, as uh, good as reading the book. You can, go, you can go back to the book and read it over and over. But it is an interesting, an interesting um, development. And uh, some of you might, might enjoy it. If you enjoy, if you enjoy the book and you enjoy board games, then I think you know, this is worth picking up and playing. You will enjoy this as well. So there we are. That's the end of my review of Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norell. The board game available from Osprey Publishing. Thanks for watching, everyone.